Hi, everyone. My name is Delaney Piggins. I use she, they pronouns. I am the executive director of Ring of Keys, and I'm really excited to welcome everyone to our panel this evening. Uh, consultants, advocates, and coordinators uh, working with specialists on the stage and screen. We have a really exciting conversation uh, with folks across the industry this evening um, who can share a little bit more about uh, how we work with specialists in the room, uh, regardless of our role in the industry. Um, as a part of Ring of Keys, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization focused on building visibility and community for uh, queer women, trans, and non-binary artists in musical theater. Um, and part of that is bringing in uh, learning and education like this panel tonight. One of the things that um, I'm really excited about with tonight is uh, being able to introduce you to each of the panelists and to Brooke. Um, and I think I should probably start with a visual description of myself. I've been jumping around here. Um, so uh, again, my name is Delaney. I use she, they pronouns. Um, I am white with brown bobbed hair, a bright red top, and a blurred background. Um, I also have a little necklace with a couple pearls, feeling very fancy this evening on my neck. Um, and I'm coming to you from Chicago, which uh, are also the traditional lands of uh, the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi Nations. Um, and I'm excited to introduce you to our folks this evening. Um, thanks to HowlRound for uh, live streaming us on your platform. Uh, we also have um, a couple individuals in the Zoom room with us, so we're excited to have a nice cozy conversation. Um, without further ado, I'm going to connect you over to uh, Brooke M. Haney. Um, Brooke is a uh, an intimacy director and coordinator, um, and we actually met. We decided to talk about bringing in this panel um, when we met at my first event as executive director, our gala in January. Um, and that just sparked, sparked a whole conversation about um, what uh, specialists and coordinators and advocates can um, do to get more involved in Ring of Keys. Um, and also what that uh, incredible wisdom and expertise that you all hold, um, how that can be a resource for our network of over a hundred keys uh, across the country. Um, so we started talking about what it looks like to uh, advocate for people in the room um, and also um, what that might look like when we're talking specifically about uh, queer artists uh, in the musical theater space um, and in uh, on the screen as well. So I'm gonna pass it over to Brooke. Um, and uh, Brooke, if you don't mind introducing our panelists this evening and then launching us in. Thank you so much for joining us. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Brooke M. Haney. I use they and she pronouns. I am coming to you from Lenape land, colonially known as New York City. And I am wearing a mauve-ish jumpsuit, though you can only see it from about the collar up. And I'm sitting on a very comfy blue chair with curtains on either side of me and a gold frame behind me that is empty. Uh, and I'm just so happy to be here. So I wanted to start, Raja, I'm gonna go alphabetical. Uh, this is Raja Benz. And would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Hi y'all, uh, my name is Raja Benz. Um, I use the she series of pronouns. Uh, I'm currently, uh, visiting from Randolph College in Lynchburg, Virginia, uh, where I'm teaching some grad students, some intimacy work. Um, but overall, um, I'm a full-time uh, intimacy and cultural consultant at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, and my work is primarily as an intimacy coordinator, uh, intimacy choreographer, as well as a gender and cultural consultant. Um, are we going over anything else? It feels pretty... That's oh, a visual description, of course. Um, oh, yeah. We did discuss that, of course. My, my, uh, apologies. I'm wearing sort of a burnt orange shirt here today in front of you um, in a completely white dorm room um, from which I'm teaching currently. Uh, you can see some visible tattoos on me as I move throughout the frame, uh, including the word soft here on my sternum, 
Uh, I have a little bit of makeup on, um, although it's difficult to tell, uh, and some fun dangly earrings as well. Thanks, Raja. All right. Bridget McCarthy, I think you are next. Awesome. This is Bridget. Hey, y'all. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, my name is Bridget. I'll take any pronouns that are used respectfully. I'm calling here today from Atlanta. Um, my visual description is that I'm a large bodied, uh, white and femme looking person with very Ashkenazi pale skin and dark hair and dark eyes. Um, I'm wearing a black tank top so you can see my shoulders and I have uh, a myriad of, of pictures behind me. Um, I am a, a mental health coordinator and a, a theater maker. I'm the director of engagement and education at Stage Door Theater, and uh, I subsidize my theater habit with work as a mental health coordinator for theater and film. Um, and I, uh, yeah, was that it? I think that was it. Oh, my, my just my my training is that I'm I'm uh, I have a master's in clinical counseling with a specialty in expressive arts therapy. Awesome. Thanks, Bridget. And I have a colleague who's really excited that I'm talking by myself and my colleague might make himself known. That's my dog. He's Oberon. He's 95 pounds. <laughs> I also have a colleague with me. This is Brooke. Cool. Talking. I also have a colleague with me named Indigo, who is nine pounds and may join us throughout the evening. She is a shaggy black little puppy. Uh, Catherine, would you like, Catherine Miller, would you like to go? Yes, yes. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Catherine Miller. My pronouns are they, them. Um, I am a white person with uh, brown, shaggy hair and bangs. Um, I'm wearing a green button-up vest, and I'm wearing a charm necklace that I chose. I, you know, those charm things you can get done and pick your charms and make your own necklace. I don't know. I'm cliche. Um, and uh, I... Where oh, I am based in Chicago, uh, on the um in the traditional lands of the Council of Three Fires. Um, I uh actually came in so I work as a gender consultant, but I came into it uh from a background of dramaturgy. That's what my degree is in. Um, and I just kept talking about gender a lot, and people were like, "Hey, you should probably talk about this and get paid to do it." Um, but I also have a minor in gender studies, um, from the theater school to Paul. Uh, and I also work as a casting director um, and dramaturg as well. Awesome. Thanks, Catherine. And last but definitely not least, Chels Morgan. Hi, um, my name is Chels. My pronouns are they, them, or AJ, or any neutral pronoun you can think of is probably exciting for me. Um, I'm a medium toned Afro Latina uh, person. I'm wearing, I have four braids in my hair today. I'm wearing a black shirt with a silver chain. Um, behind me, I have some ambiguous blue and gray art that was probably bought at like, I don't know, home goods. Um, <laughs> and currently I am on Lenape Land in New York visiting family. Um, and normally I, claim Kish Tongva and Shumash land. I've been working out of LA for the last three years, but I'm relocating to Chicago. So everyone every, everyone else said, I agree with you. <laughs> um, so, so as far as my work goes, um, I do a lot of things as well. Uh, I'm here talking about my work as a cultural competency specialist and DEI consultant for film, TV, theater, and anyone else who needs it. Um, I also am an intimacy and movement choreographer for stage and screen, um, director, and just like all, all around art maker in various ways. Um, but yeah, that's me. Awesome, thanks Charles. Uh, this is Brooke. And I wanted to give everyone an idea of our goal for the evening, what we're hoping you'll take away from tonight. Our goal tonight is bringing together these different positions and experts in the field, people that I very much respect and am excited to be talking with. We're hoping to foster meaningful dialogue, share insights and experience, and work towards creating a more inclusive and representative narratives in the theater or film and TV. Um, and we're hoping that we can be specific and give you some actionable information. To that end, we're a pretty small group in the Zoom, and we know some of you are all live streaming with HellRound, that's so exciting. Feel free if you have a question as we're going, this does not have to be so formal. So feel free to ask, we're excited about it. But And 
we will leave a little bit of time at the end for some Q&A. So to get started, I was thinking many of us are intimacy coordinators in here. So would one of you like to jump in and just share for anyone who maybe doesn't know, what are the basics of that position? I don't mind doing it, it's Chels. Great. Um, so an intimacy coordinator, which is the title for screen or an intimacy director or choreographer for stage um, is on basic level, someone who is in charge of just ensuring consent and ensuring just like humanity and integrity uh, during staged intimacy, um, making sure that everyone is comfortable with what's happening and also making sure that the intimacy on stage serves the story. Um, so we work with everybody in the process. We work with the actors and the directors, but also with the designers and also with, um, you know, if it's film with the, with the other departments to ensure that, you know, what's being seen on screen or seen on stage is something that all the actors are comfortable with, that they can do without stepping into a space of trauma, um, but also that it's beautiful and that it makes the this, this story better. And yeah. Great. Thanks, Charles. Um yeah, go Raja. Oh yeah, I was gonna say, uh, so it's me, Raja. Um, I was introduced to some language about what my role is that I really appreciated and wanted to shout out. Um, it was introduced to me by Dr. Karen Wadley, uh, who also teaches at the University of Michigan with me, uh, who offered that much of what we do is overseeing the ethical stewardship of storytelling over its sort of lifespan um, and helping understand that the span of our role often does go as long as inception to reception of the piece so we may be integrated as early as the idea uh, and we may be working as late as uh, audience processing um, some of that really does call into question what I know a lot of what we're going to do which is where does this sit with say community engagement work versus x y and z but I really taken my role to meaning the ethical stewardship of this story over its lifetime um, how we deal with each other how we deal with the story what it represents, all of those those uh, matters at hand. That's cool. I like that. Uh, Brooke here. I have found, I think because intimacy professionals maybe got a lot of attention in the media and a lot have, and therefore people are more apt to budget for us and hire us than some of the other positions maybe we're going to talk about tonight that sometimes an intimacy professional is hired when what someone actually needs is either instead or in addition, a mental health coordinator or a gender consultant or a cultural consultant or a disability advocate, you know, one of these other positions. Bridget, you are big in the mental health coordinator movement. Could you please share a little bit about how the work mental health coordinators do is different from what ICs do, and I know you do both. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'll let you know that I'm still speaking in draft because we're <laughs> we're still figuring it out. So when I know for sure, I'll let you know. <laughs> um, but but until then, um, I think about my work as two separate things, and there's my work, and then there's my job. And I think I want to kind of amplify what Raja said, which is the work that I do is ethical stewardship of storytelling of, of creators and consumers. I think that work belongs to everybody who's a, a creative collaborator. Um, my job is that I kind of think of myself as a psychological stunt coordinator slash psychological set medic. So I'm there to make sure that uh, we have the tools present to reduce risk of harm um, in performing content. Even if I'm not the one providing the tools, I'm just like checking the box and making sure that they're there and then stepping out. Um, or I'm actively facilitating it if the tools uh, don't necessarily exist there or, or uh, refining them. Um, and then I'm also like that psychological set medic where if something goes awry or if someone has concerns about the content, it's too close to lived experience. Um, I'm there to help handle that safely and, and um, kind of manage manage any anything that comes from that. Um, and my scope is specifically related to mental health and substance use because I, I'm a therapist. I'm also in recovery. So that, that lived experience part is in there, but it doesn't mean that I'm necessarily qualified to handle any tough subject matter just because of my degree. <laughs> I think that's, this is Brooke. I think that's so important how we can be an expert and still have the, the amount of scope within our expertise 
and how important it is for us to be clear about that, to take on the projects that are right for us and not the ones that are not. Um, Raja Chells, Catherine, would one of you clarify, like, what's the difference for a gender consultant and a disability advocate? Um, on one sense, obviously, the nature of the content is just functionally different if we're talking about X, Y, and Z. And at the same time, these issues are so deeply enmeshed with each other that it's very easy to get, as I say, like lost in the sauce, because when you pull at gender, uh, you can't not discuss the racialized aspects of gender, um, which of course doesn't answer the question as to how to suss them out, which I think many of us are handling. Um, and the reason I, I, I bring that up is in some way, I also have to be very clear that they are specific in different jobs because those of us that have multiple lived experiences, we're often institutionally expected to provide services that fall under these jobs. Um, I receive a different contract if I'm doing gender consulting in addition to intimacy, for example. Uh, and I'll work with the team to describe when I'm doing X, Y, and Z, I'm functioning as either the intimacy person or the gender consult or whatever it might be. So there's some degree of work where it is individual project to project, especially based on the needs, but I'm often identifying like, oh, that's actually gender consulting work, which might be something like uh, addressing facilities. It might be something like um, right now we're doing an all women's uh, interpretation of Julius Caesar and helping them recognize the question we're asking is if the future is all female, will oppression go away? Well, no, we understand that racialized aspects of uh, all of these things will show up. So anyways, all this to say, it's it's both difficult to suss out and incredibly necessary. And many of us are struggling with that question, I think. Yeah, thanks, Raja. Yeah, I'm, it's Chelsea. I'm happy to uh, build off of that. Um, so in my work, when I specifically separate cultural competency from intimacy, usually it's because uh, on a basic level, what I'm, uh, being asked to facilitate is conversations around either the cultures within the show or the cultures in the room or the culture of the room. Um, and for me, I use the word culture to exist far beyond what race is, because there's a culture that queer people have, there's a culture within disabled people uh, and the solidarity that exists within us. Um, and as someone with multiple marginalized identities and who is part of a lot of different cultures, I understand how those cannot be separated, um, especially in moments of vulnerability. So there is uh, an element of like, okay, I can be in this space and I can be facilitating this intimacy in a very particular way. Uh, but sometimes the question is not, is this an intimate moment when it comes to a kiss or when it comes to um, you know, simulated sex, uh, but this is an intimate moment between two people of differing or similar cultures. Um, and then there's also situations where maybe it's there are microaggressions in the show, maybe there's like language, maybe it's um, just the nature of like have casting like colorblind or casting differently abled performers and then realizing the show is not built for us. So how do we, so like that is a separate job of like, how do I kind of honor the show, but also honor the people and like rework everything to to fit together and to do what we intended for it to do. Um, and that, you know, by itself is an entire full time job. If you allow me to to do that, um, if you give me access to the show, I will, you know, I can do that. Um, and that's all, all happens before and during and after the scene of intimacy, you know, and the choreographing of that takes place. Thanks, Charles. Okay, so we've talked about this book here. We've talked about all the different kinds of jobs that we do. And Raja, you started to hit on how you try to be really clear about which job you're working at any given time. And I'm curious how some of you make that clear and why it's so important for that to be clear when we're working in a production. 
I just felt my whole heart sparkle. Do you mind if I, I jump in here? Please um, go for it. Cool. This is something I'm, I'm so passionate about. Um, so, so this is Bridget. Um, breathe and speak and draft. Care work is real work. And so part of the reason I find it so incredibly critical to say, yes, I am functioning in this role, in this job right now, is because care work is traditionally thought about, and justice work too, is traditionally thought about as feminized work. It's traditionally thought about as marginalized work, um, which are traditionally un, un and undercompensated and traditionally un and underrecognized. So people have been doing my job of mental health coordinator for literal eons without getting called that, getting paid for it, or, or having fancy certifications. Um, but but when I am acting in that role, I name it. Sometimes I'll even be like, oh, and I'm going to change my hat here. <laughs> I'll even do it physically so that someone can see, like, I am speaking as your supervisor. Okay, cool. Now I'm speaking as the mental health coordinator or whatever the role balance is. I don't usually take on both. Um, but it's so important because this stuff has been unspoken for so long. And so just speaking it into the room, A, helps legitimize it because words have power and B also is a consent forward practice so that people can choose whether or not to engage with me in the, in the role that I'm in. Can I offer as well that I wonder if that separation is happening in more than one realm. So I think there's a difference between separating on my contract versus separating when I make a decision in the moment on set versus the internal work that leads me to be able to do any of these jobs. Uh, kind of what I was talking about earlier, like if you can't unmarry some of these cultural sort of um, relationalities that occur, then it's difficult to really name some of the separation on the day-to-day -day choices you're making. That's also going to be very different for somebody like Bridget, where like for me, I don't do any mental health. I don't have I, the quality. It would be irresponsible for me to step into that role. I, it's less so for you not less so, very much the opposite for you because this is your work. So part of it is recognition of where my skill set's at. Part of it is recognition of how these things get documented and spoken to on the producer level. And part of it is my own internal sense of ethic and justice and what's appropriate for me to speak to and not. And those are three different realms that aren't always uh, congruent with each other. Thanks, that was Raja. Um, this is Brooke. I think this idea of being very clear about what we can do is so important. And then also what you were saying, Bridget, around this having been unpaid labor for so, so often. I think number one, because a qualification of intimacy professionals is to have mental health first aid, there became for some this assumption that we were there to take care of that part of the process. And it's kind of that idea of the, you can't hire an intimacy professional and have your box checked and everything will be safe. Like it's everyone's job to make the space as safe as possible. And one person's idea of safe is not going to be the same as somebody else's. So truly safe space doesn't really exist. Um, but I think one of the things that's occurring to me as we talk is how important it is for us to be not taking on extra jobs in order to make it clear that this production that you've chosen to do and requires, let's say three positions, those are three different people that all need to be hired and paid. One, so that people are being, you're getting the best people for your, your production. And two, so that you're not having one person that's overwhelmed and in charge of everything in the room, because that won't be useful. Uh, yeah. I've used the phrase, we don't need more superheroes who can take it on. We need people who know their scope and their roles. Yeah. Thank you, Rosa. Like, yeah. And Catherine, I just saw that I accidentally cut you off. I'm so sorry. You're fine. I'm, I'm in panel headspace mode. Um, no, I, I love what you just said, Raja. Um, this is Catherine. Uh, I also, it reminds me of when actors are asked to do emotional labor in a variety of ways, whether it's speaking to their own cultural background or their gender experience. Mm -hmm. And 
I always say that's a separate job, separate contract. And I think that, that we also need to be very like us as consultants, like I'm sometimes very bad at that. Sometimes I'm not good at advocating for myself and going, oh, that's a separate thing that I should not be doing. We need to hire someone else, but it's, it's the same mentality for actors. If they're asked to, you know, describe their entire uh, trans existence and, and when they came out and all the, like, that's, that's not your job. You're an actor. You're here to act. Let's hire someone. Like it, it's, it's, yeah, it's separate contract, separate job. Yeah. yeah Bridget, do you mind? Oh, Chelsea, I saw, I saw you first. Go ahead. Oh, good. Uh, it's Chelsea. Um, yeah, I just want to like also offer that having a separate contract or at least this, or ideally separate people, because I love the opportunities I've gotten to work with intimacy directors and to work with consultants and dramaturgs and have like a full team of us that are working together. Um, but when I'm able to like at the producer level distinguish between the work I'm doing and like when I'm uh sort of having my initial cultural competency conversations because of what I like to start with is just like a conversation on what the culture what culture is present in the room and what is what do we want the culture of this particular room to be um and during those conversations distinguishing what those hats are when you're going to see different sides of me um and when you're going to see different skill sets uh it helps me to to be able to use them both at the same time because quite frankly the reason why I'm doing both of them is because I kind of automatically do as a black queer trans person um with invisible disabilities I am doing consulting on all of those things always at the very least for myself so I can get there and leave safely <laughs> um and so part of it is just saying like okay like if I'm doing intimacy and my note on choreography is a, a more cultural note and less of like a, a a physical note or of the storytelling I feel like needs to have layers that include all of those other positions um and I'm doing multiple at the same time for a particular reason because it serves the story then having those dis things distinguished early on and having like an understanding that I'm being paid for all the levels of that work and all the levels of that experience um it also helps I think the people in the room to be able to like distinguish between those layers that we're adding on to like there's the physicality of it that could affect your body in a certain way and then there is the context that could affect your body in a different way if there's a different mental health context there's like a cultural context that is also landing on your body um and I'm supposed to be the one like helping them to process all of that and to have closure practices for all of that and to make sure that doesn't harm them in any way um and so being able to just like establish that language from the top all the way down to just when I'm actually in the room choreographing is is so crucial um, because it is it is it does make it a lot easier to distinguish the different sort of skill sets that are in use and also the different ways that this work can land on different different bodies depending on your identity. I have a thought, but Bridget, I know you were still queued up, so. You seem itchy. I'm so excited to hear this. I want to say out loud that like also so the excited. ability to turn to a producer and say like, no, I need a second contract is not equitably like I can't always do that, you know? And so it's worth saying out loud, especially those of us that occupy these multiple identities that like one, yes, it's so difficult to suss out which one I'm doing, but two, it's actually harder to get producers to understand why it's multiple. So a tip for folks that I really want to put out there is advocate for giving multiple contracts um, if their identity is part of the storytelling or if they're doing multiple roles. Like you got to do that advocacy because to producers, they're incentivized to see it as one role. Mm -hmm. And for many of us, when the identities are so close, it is hard to suss out. And so it's a power and privilege to, when you get to turn and say, these are two separate jobs. We have to understand that institutionally, not all people have been afforded that power. Um, and that does affect decision-making processes that many of us have to take. In that instance where they're saying, no, I'm paying you for, you know, just your intimacy. And I'm sitting here being like, well, it's still two trans actors and I'm not going to not provide trans competent work. I would prefer to be being paid more for that. I sit there and I go, I don't know if I want to prescribe an ethical way of 
handling that conundrum, but recognizing that the powers that be in institutions do put, especially those on the margins in those situations where they're less likely to be able to advocate for multiple contracts, et cetera. Thanks, Raja. I think one of the things that I've started trying to do is assume they're going to hire for all the roles and just say, oh, cool, who are you getting for your gender consultant? And then if they say, oh, uh, I don't know, it's like, cool, well, I have some people I could recommend. Or if that was something that I did, which it's not, I would say, were you wanting me to do both jobs? Should we talk about a fee for both? Um, but the like making the assumption that they're going to, that that was a thing that should happen for this show can help start that conversation rather than immediately having to go to, can you please pay me for both? Um, by the way, this was Brooke. Uh, Bridget, did you have anything you wanted to add or do you want to move on? Oh, just a tool. I'm Man, my brain is going in 18 different directions right now. Um, the tool I offer is is from a place of a lot of humility, knowing that this is an area that I've handled imperfectly for many, many years. Um, 99.8% of the time because I really just wanted to be the person that could help um, make a hard thing easier. Uh, and so this this tool is coming with a lot of compassion and not from a place of on high. This is coming from a place of like, yo, bruh, I've been there. Um, I have gotten into a practice where I ask myself to recite and it's R-E-C-I-T-E and it stands for what is my role? What is the environment? What is my cultural competency? Um, what is my uh, R-E-C-I, this is embarrassing, uh, cause it's late and I'm tired. My brain is Swiss cheese, but I is, oh my gosh, it's fine. It's fine. Integrity um, uh, is my guess. Integrity. It's, let's say it's integrity and Raja just guessed it. Yeah. Um, but then T and E stand for, um, ex uh, training and experience. Mm -hmm. So, so that whole formula, I go through it and number one, it slows me down because any decision made from urgency, unless someone is literally dying in front of me is not one that I need to be making. And number two, it forces me to turn my prefrontal cortex back on and go to, okay, in this moment, fighting oppression means slowing down. So what is my role here? What is my environment? How are people experiencing me in the environment? What is my lived experience intersection here? What is my cultural competency? Not all good work is my work. Is this good work my work? Um, my integrity. I'll figure out what the I stands for. I made this stupid thing. Uh, what is my training and experience around this? Every Two things are true at the same time. Everyone is going to have a first time at, someone, at something and no one deserves to be my guinea pig. So do I have access to a lifeline that I can ask someone questions? Um, so all of those things coming together have been really useful for me. Thanks, Bridget. This is Brooke. I think number one, when you're doing that work, you can look at your list and find out what the I is. Um, but is that information anywhere if someone was curious that you do know off the top of your head? Probably. Okay. Let me well, see. I know, but I was gonna <laughs> in case it was on your website oh. or something. Amanda okay. Edwards who is a co-founder with Bridget McCarthy of uh, the Association for Mental Health Professionals, practitioners? I, coordinators. It's coordinators, thank you, sorry. Um, uh, wrote a chapter in my book and Recite is in the chapter. Um, and I'm sorry that I didn't remember it well enough to uh, <laughs> remember the I, but, uh, but yeah, Bridget contributed to that chapter with Amanda. It's interest, it's conflict of interest. Do oh. I have a conflict of interest? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it is important. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. I think there's a thing that's coming up for us. Often, many of us work in theater and many of us work in theater that has lower budgets. And so the doing multiple roles comes from a desire to help, which you could also, in, you know, uh, question, is that a savior mentality? for some of us, um, but also it, a theater we want, like we want to help and the theater might not necessarily have a budget for all these roles. So in that case, what do you say? Like, do any of you have a boundary around what you won't work on if the roles aren't being covered or how, how do you balance that in your own work? 
I have no problem saying out loud that I have not always had the privilege to think that deeply. Uh, mm -hmm. I make no secret that I have dealt with uh, housing instability uh, and that it is, and to quote uh, Chels here, uh, it's very noble to take care of yourself and your family as much. Uh, and sometimes that is the decision. Um, when possible, uh, I like to think about my principles of equity uh, first and foremost. Um, am I the right person? Am I doing good by taking this? Um, and then often I also think about being willing to subsidize work that I truly believe in. And again, I know that maybe this is coming out of that savior complex and I'm fully admitting to having those struggles myself and where that all sits. But like, I need to eat. And like, if I, if part of my work is that I want to support trans women of color, uh, that means me too. I'm also a trans woman of color. So I can't overwork and hurt myself and look and say, I'm trying to forward the work of women of color um, when I am actively harming one uh, by overworking myself, not advocating for myself. And so is that easy? No, but like, it's it's a complex subject that I, I'm really still to this day openly struggle with and have published and talked about openly. Um, I don't have the answer <laughs> except for more questions. Yeah, it's just just going off of what Raja said. Um, I think as a person of color, as a trans person of color, as a disabled person, the and the desire to uplift the communities that I'm a part of and to provide this work to people who need it the most, like to center the most impacted, also is coupled with the desire to work in spaces that are victimized by oppression and that are that have low budgets because of systemic reasons and that have a lack of access to funds and lack of access to professionals for systemic reasons and on a basic level i am not shy about saying that sometimes you got to charge some people more so you can charge other people less if it's a sliding scale industry and we all have different access to uh to resources and i am happy to get three contracts from one person and one contract from another, if that's all we can do. Um, I do encourage those small theaters to not just say like, okay, we don't have enough for this. And to think about like, okay, well, maybe I will reach out to somebody who I know has a skill set to do multiple positions. Be honest, acknowledge what you're asking of them and saying, hey, we're doing this show and I need, I've reached out to you specifically because of the multiplicity of your skill set, not just because of this one position. And I'm hoping that even though I can't afford three separate rates, I can afford maybe one rate that is a little bit higher than we're usually comfortable with um, to subsidize, but I know it's not enough or I can afford one rate and then I, and I'm asking for what you're able to offer for that. Um, and I've, I've been in contact with also multiple theaters and multiple organizations where, you know, if I give my rate or if I like give transparency around all of the work, different hats that I'll be wearing and all the different jobs I'm doing, the answer is often, uh, honestly, just like a heartbreaking, like we can't afford the support that we need. Um, and I will always come back with a counter offer of like, well, you can afford at the very least, uh, like, just tell me what you can afford. And maybe it's just a workshop. Maybe it's just telling you what is what you sh what pe what resources people could be getting outside of your theater uh, maybe it's just you know a conversation or a couple zoom meetings to like give you a couple tools here and there that you can use even if i'm not the one there to facilitate those tools um there's always an option and i think that like being really transparent of like okay this is what i actually have this is what i need it might not be in line with what is deserved for all of the you know expertise or that you might be seeking out but something is better than nothing. And I do know that, that there's on a very basic level, you know, that's why I do what I do. And again, the saber complex is very present, um, but it is, it is helpful and you, and you don't know people's situations. You don't know what their capacity is. And I think assuming that capacity is also, I'm assuming that willingness to like subsidize for one project and maybe not subsidize for another project um, is also kind of blurs, blurry consent because I've, I've, I'm coming here and I'm saying I'm going to do multiple roles for you because I believe in the way that you want to integrate me into this process, then that is that is 
on me to honor myself and to make sure that I don't overextend them myself, as Raja said. Um, but also in the other vein, if I say, absolutely not, I do need two contracts and I know that you have the money, it's probably because I do anticipate or I my, through my expertise, I see the ways in which I'm going to be asked to extend further than what you're asking me to to do initially. Um, and I'm happy to explain that if folks are like, okay, well, what am I, what am I actually paying for? I'll tell you happily. Um, and I think that there's, so I think it's just like transparency around money, which is an uphill battle. Um, but if it's something that, you know, if you're someone who has an organization and this is something that you want and don't feel like you can afford, I think having an honest conversation with professionals is the way to go about it. Thanks, Charles. Yeah, Catherine. Uh, this is Catherine. Um, yeah, I think kind of going off what Charles just said, um, I, there's a, this is like a secret thing that I always do before I go into an interview um, or a conversation about hiring um, for a project is I always go to GuideStar and look up um, every nonprofit's tax returns to see how much money they make and what they're compensating. You can usually see actually what their highest employees are making. Um, I learned this in college and it's honestly been the most useful thing. You can get a free account if you want to like more access to that. You can, but like part of the law, I believe is that nonprofits have to have their tax returns pretty readily available, um, for viewing. And so I will usually look at that and I, I'm not sure if anyone has had this experience, but it's interesting to me that I feel like larger institutions, oftentimes won't ask the questions of, of do we need multiple consultants on a project, depending on how it's sussed out, they will wait until the very last minute to hire someone. And that also shows to me that like, they do have the ability to hire people with those, that money. So then I really try and like really suss out how much money they actually have in, in terms of um, compensation. So that way I can go into those negotiations. And then also, I, I mean, it's all, uh, mental health and like, um, I, I'm recently diagnosed as neurodivergent. So I've had to like completely reassess how I negotiate contracts, how I exist in rehearsal rooms. And so it's been, it's been a journey. Um, but one thing I'm oftentimes just asking is, um, what are, when I want to work with those companies that maybe have lower budgets, there's a really amazing company in Chicago called Gender Fucked Productions. That's an all trans um, artistic collective. Yeah, no, great name too. Like highly look them up. Highly recommend looking them up. They're amazing. Um, they do honestly every type of art form, um, but they are not well-funded. And I, I really am so blown away by the work that they're doing and also how they're building community in Chicago constantly. Um, we have trans beach days, which is just, it's so cool just to see that many queer people and like trans people on a beach. It's gorgeous. But um, there are times that I've wanted to work with them and we've had the conversation and they don't have a budget that usually lands with what I can do. And so I'll Skillshare. I'll go, hey, do you have someone who's a graphic designer? Do you have someone who designs websites? Like what are things that we can trade that are like, will in some way feel like compensation, but aren't because again, I will want to work with you. I just can't take up that much time and um without a little bit more compensation. And so I try and think of ways of like, what are things that I need? Does someone randomly know how to do taxes? I don't know. I, I try and really think of like, what are things that we can trade off and share? Does someone know how to do resumes? Um, Cause I'm very bad at that. Uh, because yeah, I, at the end of it, I think we, I mean, I'm not going to speak for everyone here, but I do this work because I really believe in it. And I see that, um, there is, unfortunately, it's slow change, but I see change happening and I see um, see all these amazing people on this panel and, and more out there who are doing this work. And I really see that dial moving. And so that's why I like want to work with those smaller companies that are already doing that work on a lesser budget because I see that they really have the tenacity and the drive to do it despite not having the money, so. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, Bridget, did you have something that you wanted to add? I, I will offer two two quick tools. Um, the first one is, sorry, my colleague is licking my feet. He needs to not go go there. Go over there. Thank you. Um, 
uh, <laughs> uh, though a donation letter is not going to pay my rent, um, very often if I'm working multiple contracts, I'll say I'll take a donation letter for this part. Um, and I'll, I'll deduct it from my taxes because I, yeah, I work a lot of 1099s and those are helpful. So I'll, I'll ask for a donation letter, um, which has been really useful in just on a practical level. If, if I believe in something and, and they can't compensate me appropriately, or if, if they can't compensate me, like, you know, if they compensate me at a fifth of my regular rate, I'll say, great, can I make an invoice for you for my full rate? And would you please write an in-kind donation services letter for me? And, and I've never had anyone say no. Um, so I'm, I'm not a tax person. I'm a, I'm a like heart and head person. So please talk to a real professional before you do that. Um, but that's really practical. Um, thing the second was, uh, is gone because my dog licked my feet and now I can't think of anything else. So that's, that's that. <laughs> Brooke here. Well, if it comes back to you, you know, throw it out. Uh, great. I mean, I am hearing great ideas of ways that we can advocate for ourselves, which I think if you are someone listening, who's a producer, and you have a small budget, that's a thing that you can think about. What other things can I offer if I can't afford someone's full rate? And that, that also gives you some um, power. I mean, you have a lot of power for your producer, but like it gives you some ability to recognize and honor someone's skill set, even if you can't fully do it with money. Uh, great. So we've talked a lot about scope of practice. Let's talk about what are some of the benefits of hiring these positions on your team, multiple or separate. Uh, I was thinking around like safety, artistry, and authenticity. When I think of our positions, I feel like those are the things that we really help out. Like we we hopefully make the the safe the place safer. Um, we contribute to the artistry and hopefully are making the story more authentic. So, what are some of the ways that uh, we we do that, or you each do that in your process. This was my point. It came up in a segue. This was my point. Um, so my mama used to say it costs the same whether you pay in dimes or dollars. So whether or not I am getting paid to do this work, someone is subsidizing it. And so if I am not there working on container practice and re-regulation strategies and, 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 and all of these things, someone else is absorbing that la labor. Um, and so it's going to cost, and just like in gross capitalistic terms, it is going to cost the production in time, personnel changeover, um, product, product quality, uh, or they can just pay me and I can help with those things. And, and so people don't have to take it home or people don't have to take it out on each other um, or people don't have to like, like kind of do their best to the performance of something that's really sensitive. And then that audience member ne never comes back again because they had a really awful experience watching this thing on stage. So, so I guess what I would say to that is, is this job brings a layer of and I'm not going to guarantee anything. Like if, if, you know, I, I am only a person, I'm not a Swiss army knife. I'm a person with tools. Um, but we can bring, we, I, I can help bring a layer of authentic storytelling that is, is able to be confidently consumed by audiences as well as confidently performed by performers. Um, I can help with harm reduction strategies. Um, and I can ultimately help your production cost less money. And I know that because I've seen those numbers. <laughs> Thanks, Bridget. Brooke here. One of the things I think about for myself, uh, particularly as a queer person, there is a huge difference for me if I'm working on a queer production or if I am the queer person on a almost everyone else's straight production. And the amount of work I have to do to show up and to like it's going to be hard on the not queer productions. Things are going to happen that will make it hard. And so one of the benefits I see around safety around hiring multiple people. So for example, let's say you hire, I'm the one that you hired your queer intimacy professional, but you also hire a, a gender consultant to work. Now there's two of us, right? And then if uh, maybe you hire a cultural consultant around the queerness, if your team isn't queer, like then there's three people in the room uh, talking about the same thing from different angles. 
And that really, I think it changes everything. Mm -hmm. um, and it allows the work to be more sustainable. I was gonna say, as Raja, I will say out loud that this is uh, in alignment with what a lot of us are trying to do, which is advocate for no longer being single person departments. Um, relative to artistry and authenticity and safety of it all as well, uh, for those of us that have some certain lived experiences that we represent on stage, what you're also getting from us is the ability to sustain and understand what it means. Like we don't get to walk away from the project when it gets hard. Um, when our liberation is tied to this project. So as a trans person, like transness and gender doesn't just go away if I get really exhausted by the job. Um, and for somebody who maybe ha doesn't have that lived experience and doesn't know how to sustain themselves through that, when they get really frustrated about like the gender binary in the script, they could easily just be like, fine, we're, we're, we're stage and missionary or whatever they're doing. <laughs> like, um, So we don't always have the same out. And so the authenticity, it's not just that we're better at telling the story it's that we know how to sustain ourselves in telling these stories amongst the things like production challenges you know I, I go on to set knowing that I'm going to face those challenges um and that I'm prepared for that um so we're both fighting to become non-single person departments so that we have advocates and allies in our team I like to believe that they exist on the crews around us um but should they not uh knowing that our sustainability and our ability to navigate these systems is a huge skill set that we bring. It's just, uh, thanks all of you for all of that. I just wanted to add um, that there's also like, a, like I want to say a sweetness that comes with being able to do this work. I know that there's like a lot of like, I mean, I, I, I recognize that when I'm talking to producers, I have to say, I'm going to save you time and I'm going to save you money. And I, here's why you should go with me. I'm Richie Rich. Um, but I'm just not good at that because <laughs> that's not what I'm actually here to do. Um, it, it is what happens and I will explain that and I will show you the numbers. And I, you know, like Bridget said, I, we've got the proof, um, that logistically we can help, but also I think a lot of the fear that came around intimacy professionals and also around all of the rest of the work that we do is that we're here to like police the way that artists make art um, and to police like people who go into a space with openness and who quote unquote have no boundaries. And, you know, I acknowledge that no one has no boundaries, but also maybe nothing that you're doing in the space is even coming close to what your boundaries are. And that's what you're trying to communicate to me. And that's great. If we're not coming close to any boundaries, then that means that we can essentially work as if we're not coming close to any boundaries. Um, but if you don't know what is present in the space. If you don't have up here, Chels, you froze for a moment. Have somebody there to, oh, am I back? Yeah, you're, you just got back. The last thing yeah. I heard was if you don't have boundaries in the space. Gotcha. Uh, if you don't, uh, if you're in a space, essentially, I was trying to say that we're uh, nothing that you're, none of the work that you're doing brushes up against any of the boundaries that anyone has. And so you're essentially working in a space where boundaries around the content or around the physicality isn't much of a concern, um, but you don't have anyone who's there to like ensure that that stays consistent and that, that nothing comes up or to like look more deeply or more carefully around the themes of the space. Um, then you're not, then you're going to kind of be constantly still walking on eggshells. And I think part of what I love about what I do is that I allow people to like stop walking on eggshells to like get it all out there. And best case scenario, we talk about everything and we acknowledge everything and everyone's just excited to, to do it, you know? Um, but also what happens sometimes is like you go through that whole process and then you think about an audience that comes in with a lot of boundaries and a lot of judgments and a lot of predispositions and you think about how they're going to interpret it and the closing up and the anxiety starts. Um, so I think having somebody here to give uh, like predict what uh, maybe what content warning or what information the audience might need beforehand to predict what might happen um, in the space so that we have tools for that so that we can stay as open as we want, we can make the work go further. We can push it, we, it can be more vulnerable. It can be 
you know, more representative of the communities you're trying to represent. It can be, I work on a lot of like really hyper exposed intimacy work with, I work on a lot of like full nudity. I work on a lot of like queer and trans art that is just like deeply open in a lot of ways. And that is only possible to the fullest extent because those folks, you know, call me and call their intimacy professionals and mental health coordinators and gender consultants on to make sure that that is possible in a way that doesn't harm anybody. Um, so yeah, if you just, if you really are excited about going really deep into really vulnerable work and you're afraid that hiring one of us is going to pull you back, just know that it's, it's very much the opposite. Cause I can probably speak for everyone. We say it's more exciting for us when we get a chance to really dive into it, to things rather than having to pull back. Yeah, thanks, Charles. Brooke here. Um, I think when I think of the artistry, we've done a lot of talking about the work that we do, making the process more safe. But when I think of the artistry, like that's the fun part, right? That's what Charles is getting at. Like the, this, let's get past, once we've made this space where everyone can do their best work, then we get to get into the art. And one of the things I think about is We've always hired a lighting designer and a costume designer and a, a fight director. Like we have a specialist for every other kind of storytelling. It only makes sense that we also want one around the storytelling of the touch. If I'm talking about intimacy specifically, that like someone who is there to watch the whole arc of the process around that piece of storytelling. Cause the director's looking at the whole picture and counting on the lighting designer to tell that part of the story and the costume designer to tell their part of the story. So similarly, if you have a cultural consultant and they're really looking at, is every like tableau that we're creating telling the story we're trying to tell, I think it just makes the storytelling like absolutely authentic like that's part of the art artistry but also so much more compelling um Catherine I think you had something as I well I did yeah I uh going back to the initial question I also think about language especially when we do audition postings and like the general introduction to the actual show that we're producing or working on um Obviously, as a casting director, I have that mindset often, but also a lot of the times I'm involving conversations with uh, our intimacy director um, and also like making sure that that language is so clear and so deliberate because there are oftentimes, you know, I, I think, I mean, Brooke, we talked about this on our call earlier this week, but Chicago now has, um, so we renegotiated our CAT contract, which is the Chicago Theater Area Contract with Equity. And we now have intimacy, like very specific things you have to do around intimacy work in Chicago. Um, and it's been really informative. I am actually working on a show right now that I, I cast um, that has some very heavy intimacy. And while the contract wasn't finalized until we had started, like after we had started rehearsal, we had to go back and then do an entire intimacy writer where we wrote down in detail what the actor was comfortable with, what, and like granted that stuff can change, but then they also in the cat contracts have said, you can add a different, you can add an additional writer if those things need to get renegotiated. Um, but it is really keeping companies accountable because they're, I just have seen so much, um, you know, an audition posting goes up and you know that this play has some very heavy intimacy work and there's no one listed or there's no note about, Hey, please read the entire script. So you know exactly what you're walking into or with trans actors where they, they're like, we want to see all these trans actors. Here are the vocal ranges of these roles. Like, which <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'm being a little too obvious but like those are things that it's like you want trans people to walk in your room and feel comfortable to audition for the show this is just an invitation to get seen and the more we can kind of hone that language and craft it in a way that someone can go oh I see myself in this and I actually immediately am starting to feel comfortable with these people in this room it's just going to create an all like an all-around better process for everyone. Catherine can you give a few examples of a really good way to write an audition posting around intimacy or casting 
Yes. Oh gosh. Okay. So, um, uh, I, yes. So I will, um, oh gosh, brain fart. So sorry. Um, so I, I will put you on the spot. It's totally it's good. It's okay. Um, I'll usually have the synopsis of the play or like the general synopsis that we've used, but then when it comes down to the character breakdown, I usually don't put gender descriptors of like female, male. I also like really, I really dislike the term female identifying, male identifying. I have completely like, it, it's, it, you're trans women are women period. So female identify, like you don't identify as a female, like you, you are a woman. So just removing that from that language, I'll usually put pronouns if it's actually like, if it's very important, but most of the time I try and just remove them entirely. Um, and if there's, for instance, I was working on a production of Tick, Tick, Boom. We did an all trans production of Tick, Tick, Boom uh, a couple of years ago in Chicago um, that I had cast with uh, Beau Frazier as our director. And we had multiple um, uh, piano recordings that were in different keys for every single track we were asking actors to prep for their um callbacks and like noting that we were going to do that so that way they never had to worry about walking into that callback room and going are they going to even prep this for me um so that and then also noting that we're going to have an intimacy person i i mean this is something that i i have questions about is like what do we want to get as specific and nitty gritty as possible when it comes to laying out exactly what intimacy work is going to happen in those audition postings, depending on the character that you're playing. Um, because I think that that's, I think that that's a really great idea. Um, but I also, <laughs> I feel like people will be, you know, hesitant to it. Um, and then I also say if there's also a role that you maybe aren't called in for and that you feel better aligns with who you are or how you exist in the world, let us know. And we'll call you in for that role as well. Um, me, honestly, it's all about transparency and theater. I mean, I, can, I don't really work in film and TV, but I can say theater, theater is so scared of transparency and it's so funny to me. Um, and it's something that I'm trying to kind of break down the barriers of constantly in a lot of the work I do. Yeah. I speak well. well. um, just because I think that people often have the exact same conversation when it comes to culture, because there is a fear, and I think it's the same fear of transparency, um, of saying that like, okay, like, for example, this is a Black show, and we want Black actors, but I can't, not every Black person necessarily looks as I guess quote unquote black as some people would like them to um, or just every person of color like you there's not always a way to tell what someone's background is um, or you know and often either illegally or ethically depending on your level of organization you cannot ask about gender or about sexuality or about uh, culture um, and I think that like there again it, it, Everything I'm saying, if you work in academia, Charles has frozen for a moment, so we will all freeze with them. Maybe let's all take a good stretch because you know, like physically, we I don't know what it's been a long back. Are we here? You're there. Yeah, you're back. Right. Charles, you're awesome. back. Hooray! Right. Right. You were saying this... for those of us that work in academia. Yes, for those of you who work in academia, um, this may not apply to you, depending on what state you're in and who the director of your program is and what your deal is. And I'm sorry about that. We can talk separately. Um, but overall, I think that there is having transparency in the audition notice of like, this is the background of the character. Uh, we are hoping to cast someone uh, of the same like diasporic background and thinking about like the concept of a diaspora and saying like, hey, you might not be like I'm working on a show right now in Philadelphia that has a Syrian American refugee hijabi. You might have one or two of those things, but you might not be all of them, but you might really, really relate to the character and or this might be the first time you've seen anyone who even comes close to representing you on this scale. And you want to embody that because there's usually only one role or two roles at high levels for us. Um, and then, you know, there, also there might be a lot of personal reasons why someone might want to embody a particular role that, you know, could be incredibly valid. Um, and 
you know, I think that there is just understanding that there is language for that and then knowing that like the hiring somebody or at least like paying for an hour of consultation if you can't pay for an entire production of like, hey, here's a list of questions that can at least get me started. Um, and so you have language around, you know, what Catherine was saying around trans folks and around um, saying, hey, there's going to be an intimacy professional there. Uh, I think it's We've frozen again, so we're waiting. <laughs> we're just like breathing together. Well, within your reasoning to say, like, I'm, at, I'm back. I feel it. I can feel it in my bones. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I don't know what's happening to my internet. This is New York City, I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, just saying that there's going to be a queer or trans affirming intimacy professional, saying that there's going to be an intimacy professional of the diaspora there uh, as a way to get more specific about, like, hey, we are doing our best. There's gonna be a cultural sensitivity person. Um, like even even down to languages, like we will hire a consultant if needed, depending on who we cast. Uh, like trans folks are in, in like are encouraged to apply to, to a potentially a non-trans role and that we will get a consultant if that's necessary. Um, I think just like having that language and those options is, it's gonna be really helpful for folks. Thanks, Charles. I think part of what this comes down to, if we talk about like when people start to find their team, it's the like how early you start recruiting for these positions makes a difference. If you can hire, this is Brooke, by the way, if you can hire your intimacy person, your cultural consultant, your disability specialist, your mental health coordinator before casting, then those folks can help you write the casting notice. Um, so that as Catherine was saying, you give as much information as possible. Because Catherine, I agree with you, the more information, the better. I feel like as an intimacy professional, that's one of the biggest parts of my job is giving actors as much information as possible so that they can make some choices, but also so they don't have to wonder. I think often actors, spend a lot of their energy wondering what to expect when if we gave them that information, they can like let go of that and focus on their job. Uh, so let's say someone's gonna interview you for your job. What are good questions that they can ask you to find out about your process, right? So that we're not, um, depending on other kinds of a box check. Like, how can someone know how you work and ask a good interview question? I think one, before we can even get there, one mm -hmm. thing I'll point out that does connect a little bit to what we we're talking about, and I think is a great bridge to hear, right. is that we gotta get better at letting directors and producers know that they get to have boundaries too um, around this work. Um, so when we're talking about casting calls, it's not good to be like, Whatever the actors are comfortable with, not because we care less about the actor's comfort, but because the director should have a strong directorial vision. And it is okay for them to say, no, that nudity is important to my direction. Mm -hmm. um, and so on this conversation of like specificity versus not, um, that's part of it. And I think only until, I mean, that's most of where I start is I have to explain to the director, no, 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 you get to tell me what you want to have. If it's legal, you can ask for it. There may not be ethical, you know, there might be ethical questions at play and maybe I'm going to say, oh, it's not for me, but um, you can ask for that. And that's where I start the conversation. And then once I provide them that information, the conversation shifts really quickly and they start asking me, so how do you support that process? And what I want them to start listening for is specific actionable items. I think as theater people, we talk a lot in the um, ideal and it's really hard to say no. Um, one of the things I do to create a culturally competent room is I do not use um, sort of carcerally based punishment uh, as part of my teaching, that I actually actively structure um, ways to sort of address the sort of integration of like carceral justice into our education that I do. I work in universities, obviously. So, um, so that's a big one that I want them to ask me is, 
not just what my process is, but how can I articulate it into actions? Because anybody can walk into the room and say, oh, well, I'm going to make it safe and I'm going to make sure everybody feels good and I'm going to make sure that no one gets hurt. And I'm going, but how will you do that? And the problem is some people can answer that and some people can't. And that's going to be an indicator of how prepared somebody is to work on your production, in my opinion. Yeah, Bridget. Um. I don't know that this is as, as applicable for, for other. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I have, I have one point from the previous point, if you don't mind, and then I'll, I'll move into this one, if that's okay. Um, one of my, my practices as a theater professional is that I have stopped assuming that actors have read the script. I actually assume that no actor between their serving job and their nannying job and running and being on the train and being late to the audition I assume every actor will pretend they've read the script I assume that every actor has not read the script and so when I'm doing content disclosure content notes um I go in with that thought um because it has saved me it has saved our company so much time and energy and in the cleanup after the fact after we've mismanaged expectations um so just offering that as a tool for for others if they want to use it um in terms of what questions I would love to, to be asked, uh, I would love for someone to ask me what happens, uh, how do you handle it when you screw up? I think that uh, uh, conflict competence is a huge part of this. Um, and again, I'm not saying this from on high, I'm saying this as a person who's handled this very imperfectly, um, but a hallmark of my job is what happens when someone comes to me and they say, you screwed up. And I, I have to have the regulation skills and the my own deconstruction work to take a breath and go, if you're telling me it's because you want to repair this. Okay, thank you. Thank you for coming to me. Let's go. <laughs> um, so I think that's a question that I want a lot more of in every interview that <laughs> that is, is hiring a position of, like this. How does it work when you screw up? Um, I would love to hear... Uh, what is your th what do you hope your thumbprint is in a room? Like, oh, Bridget's been here. How do I know that? <laughs> I would love to hear that. Um, and then the actionable piece, like what, yeah, how do you, how do you make this, how do you make it dance? <laughs> Anyone can say that they make people feel safe. What does that even mean? Um, what is the structure that is embedded in that? I think a question, this is Brooke, I think a question I love is when a director asks me um, how I like to work with them, because that's so often what I'm asking them, because I am ready to merge my process to the directors and the actors and the team. But in an interview, if a director asks me how I like to work, I love that question so I can say, well, I love to come in as a choreographer. I understand you might have an idea of choreography and if you do, great, we can do your vision and I can desexualize the language and I can handle it in these ways, but I love to work as a choreographer. So, you know, so I love, I love those questions where it's finding how are we on the same team and what does our team look like? Um, I think for me, um, I, I mean, I think that the questions that usually excite me the most um, are usually we're like kind of after I have the same conversation that Raja was referring to of like, you can ask for anything and what is your like sort of major, like what got you to be on this call with me? Like, what is the, because I know there's always probably one scene or like one little bit of things where you're like, okay, the whole show could help, but this one thing I want to do really is why I called you. Um, I like when people genuinely just ask like, what would you, how would you handle that situation? Like, I want this particular type of nudity or there's this one scene of extreme, like um, where there is some actual, uh, cultural concerns or where like there's some scenes that I'm I'm genuinely worried about um, I think that some folks shy away from questions like that because of the risk of like doing the work and then not getting the job like taking that information and running with it but in my opinion 
cool. Like, <laughs> like, great. I'm glad you got the tools you needed. Um, it just wasn't obviously meant to, to be. Um, but I like that because I want, I really do want to know that you also have actionable items in your head and that we can kind of like, that you know that I have a plan for, or at least tools ready for that can help you specifically in this exact context. Cause sometimes even generalized actionable items are like, okay, cool. That sounds good. But if that doesn't come up or if that there's no, they don't anticipate that being an issue, sometimes it's still difficult. Um, so yeah, I really like questions that are like, I'm going to be honest with you. I, there's 30 minutes of uh, full frontal nudity in this show. And I want to know, like, I want to just like not avoid it. I want to just say it and see what you, how you're going to facilitate that. And that way I can give you actionable items specifically surrounding the production, as opposed to just like general tools that I would pull out if they're necessary. Yeah, thanks, Charles. This is Brooke. I think one thing that that helps me know is that a producer isn't checking a box by hiring me. They, it's not just like, I think I need an IC. It's that I need an IC for these moments. How can we work together on them? So yeah, I agree. I appreciate those specifics. Uh, we have about 13 minutes left of our glorious conversation. So I want to open it up to anyone either on the live stream or here in the space if you have questions. I'm gonna ask one more question of the panelists to give you a chance to think about it. But if you wanna either raise your hand or throw it in the chat, Delaney will uh, offer those up to us. Um, so while we're waiting, while you all, when a pr production hires us, outside of simply hiring for the role, what is a way that they can make the process feel more inclusive across the board? I'm gonna I'm gonna push back on the language feel, and, right? Um, because it's easy to make it feel that way. It's difficult to actually do, um, and recognizing that difference is probably step one. Uh, I believe that we need to see uh, trans people and people of the global majority in more positions of power. Um, and that's part of uh, the inclusion process in my mind. Um, we need to be stakeholders at all levels of this. Um, and then finally, production, I want I want when you're hiring an intimacy professional for folks to start to learn the multiple ways of knowledge that we have and the multiple ways that our knowledge show up on our resumes. Um, because my experience as a sex worker was just as important as any workshop I ever took. Um, and you can't put that on a resume. And so many of us, you know, there used to be this myth that we all came from fights and we're all just, you know, reformed, you know, fight girls, which like I'm purposely saying that because there's a gendered element of who we're assumed to all be, um, which is not true. Um, but all this is to say that like, as the field changes and shifts, many of us will not be coming up from the traditional routes that many of the early pioneers of this work um, did follow. Many of them were fight professionals, um, but many of us are now coming to it from new ways. Um, people are coming out of sex therapy backgrounds, backgrounds as actors and performers and, and advocates and grassroots. And if we only can see things that visibly look like intimacy or culture, whatever we're applying to, and only see those as markers of a successful career and aptitude towards this work, um, we're going to put up barriers to access for the people who I think need to be at the center of this work. Um, I'm not suggesting that white women need to stop doing this work, but I do need us to acknowledge that it is a large portion of who is doing this work because of institutional reasons, uh, both the division of uh, the sexual division of labor that we discussed and also um, just suggestions of white womanhood and what the responsibility is there. So I just want to say out loud that maybe inclusion looks like looking at a resume that doesn't have every huge lore theater on it, but recognizing they've trained, they've studied, they've learned with people. There's a myth that undertrained intimacy professionals cause more harm than good. And I do not subscribe to that myth myself. Um, I also want to jump off of that and again, challenge the language around feeling versus being um, because sometimes a room that actually has done the work. And by sometimes, I mean, nearly every time a room that has all the consultants and has done the work and has like, is 
giving people of color space uh, and trans people and people of other multi marginalized identities space to exist and to show up in their fullness. Um, those spaces are emotional and they're heavy and there's usually crying and there's usually um, a lot of like also unpacking that your body is doing where they're shedding down the walls and there's more conflict in those spaces sometimes and there's more conversation and that is uncomfortable and that is and that might feel like failure um, to a lot of folks who are used to a smooth silent process that where everyone pretends that nothing is wrong. Um, and I think that that I want to push back on, you know, sometimes rooms that are inclusive won't won't feel like it because we have this myth around what inclusivity is going to feel like, as if it's going to feel like safety, as if it's going to feel like comfort. And we are we are breaking down walls. We're doing something brand new. We're doing we're healing parts of our body minds that we didn't even know needed healing. Um, and that is uncomfortable and that hurts and that is cathartic. Um, and that requires professionals to make sure that everyone comes out of that feeling like something has healed as opposed to something has, you know, further been like been further harmed. Um, so part of it is just like, if you hire one of us and that is like the most emotional process you've been through in years, um, that is not a failure. That is not never again. That is like, okay, that was hard. The next one will be easier. Um, and or not <laughs> that's okay too um but this it's going to take some time it's going to take some dismantling it's going to take some healing it's going to take some tough tough conversations around you know past failure and how that's showing up now um and yeah i just just don't fall for the myths the mythos of immediate comfort because that immediate comfort is you know white supremacy culture that is what it's taught us Thanks, Charles. Uh, one question that we got is, what are ways that other departments like lighting and costume designers and such can support working with intimacy coordinators, cultural consultants? What are ways that they can partner with us? I'll start with the lighting designer since that was an example. Please learn how to light multiple skin tones and darker skin tones. It's absolutely ridiculous when I can't see uh, some actors because they're poorly lit because no one ever taught lighting designers how to light skin other than white skin. Uh, <laughs> uh, beyond that, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm just gonna leave it out there. That's my that's my one take real quick. Is you know the history the history of photography and color and technology uh, and skin color is quite deep and there's a lot of research to be had there. Uh, and I do think that that is an essential part of being a lighting designer, for example. Thanks, Raja. Bridget. Um, it's, it's two parts. It's, it's that I am damn sure that I cannot do your job. It's I am positive that you are here because you have superpowers that I surely don't have. Um, I swear to you, I'm not coming for it no part of me wants to costume design another production of importance of being earnest or whatever. Like I promise you that's yours. Um, and I am so excited about the superpowers you bring to it. And so if there is something that you're concerned about or a way that I am communicating with you that, that isn't jiving with you, I promise I don't have ego in this. Please help me work with you better. If my communication style is the thing that's getting in the way of you and I being able to partner or me being able to uplift you and your work, like I'm, I'm so open to that feedback, but I, I find that because costume designers and lighting designers and, and other technicians have been subsidizing a lot of this work for a long time and thinking of all the wardrobe crews who have listened to breakdowns over and over again, because no one else was there to listen. Like, like I am so grateful for the unpaid labor that these departments have done for so long. And I am stepping in to help support, not to devalue or, deleg or uh, um, delegitimize the work that you've done in the past. Um, so if there is something that I am doing to, to break down our partnership or communication, I'm always open to that feedback. Thanks, Bridget. Uh, it's Chels. Um, mine is like, talk to me. I'm trying to talk to you. Um, and part of this is on the producer level. And on like, you know, I know that the first day of rehearsal, there's like the design presentations that happen. 
Um, but I also want you to stay for my like cultural competency conversation when I talk about and set boundaries around the culture of the room because you can raise your hand and you can contribute to how you work and say like when I come in for tech, I want to acknowledge that I've missed this much and so I want a refresher or like talk to me about what your needs are too. And I think that more and more productions are saying like, hey, is it okay if we allow the designers into this conversation? And I'm like, I have been asking for that since the beginning, please enter the conversation because I've got bullet points for you first of all. <laughs> and secondly, um, because you know, there's a certain point where creative leaves and tech stays behind. And I want I want to talk to the wardrobe. I want to talk to, you know, ASMs and stagehands and folks who are making this happen to make sure that this culture continues through the end of the process. Um, so yeah, I think it's just very much like just please uh, know that we're here for you too and and talk to us. If I can add just a piece. Um, I found language. I found language. Um, thank you, Chels, for that. That helped find language. Um, I promise your boundaries matter also. I think that is the thing that I would say to to our designers and our technicians, our create our creative technician professionals out there, is that like I think that specifically technicians, um, their boundaries have been stomped on in a way that that actors don't necessarily have language for either. Um, but I have seen so many technicians who have been run into the ground by this industry. Um, so many. Um, and so I would invite, I would invite any designer or technician who I'm working with to to first take a moment and and help me build a space where their boundaries matter too. And sometimes that means telling me what they are. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Catherine. Um, I would talk about costume design. Uh, I think it's really important to, uh, you know, make sure that trans actors have their preferred binder, have trans tape, depending on what their needs are. If they're specifically sensitive about, you know, gender dysphoria, like I literally can't look at a skirt. I can't. And so like, what are the things that you need to check in with actors in terms of not only just like the build of a costume or what they're wearing on stage, but also texture, especially like I think about like folks who have just sensitivity to certain textures or fabrics, um, but doing that ahead of time too, because I can't tell you what happened. Like I had a process uh, a couple of years ago where an actor um, was asked like a month before he started the process what their preferred binder was also not assuming that an actor who is a trans mask individual has had top surgery not assuming like what what gender um affirming things folks have done um but coming back to that point um uh forgot that they had said given that preferred binder then walked in first day of rehearsal and it was right there and it was just like they were so happy that they never had to have that really awkward conversation of hey I need this thing. Um, so really jumping on that as quickly as possible once an actor is cast. This is Brooke. Uh, I would say it takes all of us to make this work happen. And information is so valuable. So any information you have from your department, I'm gonna constantly be trying to think of questions I should ask you about wardrobe or about what's the height of the table going to be or things things like that but any information that you think might help me so that when we get to tech we're uh prepared for it is wildly helpful so talking early in the process is super useful uh i want to thank everyone Catherine, Chels, Bridget, Raja, this was a great conversation. And I want to throw it back to Delaney for anything you need to say to Keys or other audience before we go. Most of it is gratitude. I just want to thank everyone on this panel and thank you, Brooke. Um, not only for the expansion of my mind and my heart around these things, but really specific actionable steps that I feel like anyone who enters the room and who is working alongside you can use and take forward. So I just wanna thank you, that's really invaluable. Um, I also wanna thank HowlRound, thank you for streaming. Um, and uh, thank you also to the National Captioning Institute. If you are watching this in archive, um, they are responsible for those captions. Um, thank you, Raja, thank you, Chels, thank you, Catherine, and thank you, Bridget and Brooke. 
Um, I lastly just want to say, you know, we will be continuing to host conversations, learning sessions, workshops. This is the first of many sort of once a month offerings that we're doing. So we will be announcing another one soon in July. If you are uh, connected to our newsletter, if not, if you're watching on the live stream, you can um, check out a link in our website and get connected so you can stay up to date and hear from more wonderful experts and professionals like these folks. Um, and if you are around the NYC area and you want to meet up with Ring of Keys, uh, we are co-hosting an event with Maestra and with Tempo. Um, following the June 30th Pride Parade, we'll be at the Dramatist Guild Foundation. So come and meet some more folks and say hi and um, just hang out. It's a social event. It should be a little bit fun. And if you are not familiar with Ring of Keys, if this is new to you um, and you valued this conversation, um, these are uh, paid artists. These are paid conversations. Our goal is to support artists and to uplift the work that they do. Um, and we uh, can't do that without you. So if you uh, feel like this was meaningful, feel like this was worthwhile and want to contribute to what we pay artists, um, you can also find a link for donations on our website. Um, with all of that, I want to uh, go ahead and let you all have a great evening. And uh, I hope that this was part of it. So thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for everyone who came and tuned in on Zoom and on HowlRound. And thank you especially to panelists and to our facilitator, Brooke. Have a great evening. <laughs>